How you doing, everybody? It's great to see everybody. My name is Pastor John. I'm the community pastor here in Binghamton. It's my pleasure to welcome each and every one of you here uh, to Two Rivers Church. I just want to say a special hi to all of our campuses, Corning and Cortland and Binghamton. Just thank you. Come on, let's give a round of applause for our campuses. And if you're a first-time guest with us here at Two Rivers Church, we just want to thank you for attending. Thank you for being a part, and just thank you. And we know that you're going to have an amazing experience today. We're in a, in a series called Swipe Right, and we're in week two of that series. And what we've been examining over, the, over this series is what we're examining the life and death power of sex in relationships. And sex is a, is a powerful thing, uh, and, and it, really, it really has a, a life and, and death consequences to our relationship. So what we're going to open up today is we're going to be in Hebrews chapter 12. We're going to start in verse 16 and 17. If you want to take a minute to go there uh, while I introduce to you today's title, to, today's title of today's message is The Point of No Return. You know, the point of no return is really, it's an aviation term. It's an aviation term. It refers to the the point at which an aircraft gets to where it can no longer turn back and make it home. That's what it refers to. It refers to a point at which you can no longer get back to where you started from. It's this point where we just can't return from. So what we're going to do is we're going to, we're going to do, introduce some scripture today, and we're going to look at the, the life of a man who made a decision in a moment that he wished that he could erase. He made a, he made a momentary decision, and he, and he lost so much. Who, who can identify with that idea of making a decision that you regret? I, I know I can identify with that idea, and that, and that, you know what, today, the gist of today's message is, is that there's real power in the decisions that we make. There's real power in the decisions that each and every one of us make. They have eternal consequences when we make decisions in our lives. So in Hebrews chapter 12, we're going to examine and look at this guy named Esau. Now Esau was named that because obviously I guess he was born as this hairy baby because Esau means hairy. That's what it means. Can everyone say Esau? Esau. Esau. Yeah. So I don't, I don't know why. I don't think I'd want to be known for being the, 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 hairy, the hairy guy. I know sometimes my wife says I might be a little too hairy. But I, I don't know if I'd want to be known as that, that hairy guy. And what we're going to do, so we're going to examine this syndrome almost that Esau had. You see, Esau traded away God's lifelong gift in order to satisfy a momentary need. He, sa- he, he, he sacrificed God's plan for his life to satisfy this momentary fleeting need. Let's look together at Hebrews 12, verses 16 and 17. It says here, See that no one is sexually immoral or is godless like Esau. Ooh. Who for a single meal sold his inheritance, rights as, as the oldest son. Afterwards, as you know, when he wanted to inherit this blessing, he was rejected. And even though he sought the blessing with tears, he could not change what he had done. I want to give you some context today about Esau. You see, Esau was the grandson of a guy named Abraham. And and this guy named Abraham is probably one of the more famous men of the Old Testament. You see, Abraham was given this promise. And this promise was an amazing, unbelievable promise that he would be given a son in his old age, that him and Sarah, his wife, would have a child. And I mean, when I say old, I'm not talking like, Hey, like my kind of old, which my son thinks I am. I'm talking, I'm talking the kind of old, like decrepit old. Like there's no way those geezers are having kids. That kind of old, okay? And God promises 
to Abraham and Sarah that you're going to have a son, and not only a son, that you're going to birth a great nation. And this nation is going to be more plentiful than all of the stars in the sky. It's an amazing promise. And he, he delivers this promise to them, and then guess what? As God has a way of doing, his timing takes place. Have you ever waited on God and his timing? I know that I have tried to rush his timing a time or two in my life, and they had to wait a season for God to show up, and then guess what showed up? A baby boy. Uh, the, the, the first in this promise, this first in this birthright to, to be a great nation, a boy named Isaac. And Isaac grew up, and he married a woman named Rebekah, and Rebekah had twins. And the first of those twins to be born was Esau. And he had a twin brother named Jacob. And the Bible actually talks about how close they were together, how close they were born together, that Jacob was actually clinching the heel of Esau as he was born. You see, Esau had an amazing birthright that he was born into. He had a, he had a lineage and a prize to look forward to. But you see, Esau didn't experience any of that. You know, the Bible tells us uh, later, a few hundred years later, actually, that God shows up to Moses. And when he shows up to Moses, he says, I'm the father, I'm the God of Abraham and Isaac, not Esau. If you know anything about your Bibles, he didn't say, and Esau, did he? He said, and Jacob. You see, Esau traded his birthright away. He surrendered his birthright to his brother, to his baby brother. He traded his birthright. This amazing birthright that he had, he, he just simply surrendered it and gave it away. And you think, well, with a birthright like that, what could Jacob have offered him? What is this amazing thing that, I, that, that, that would cause Esau to surrender this birthright? And guess what? It was a bowl of stew. It was a simple bowl of soup. Just for a simple bowl of soup. You see, what happened was Esau was kind of like a manly kind of man. You know, he liked to hunt. And he was out hunting. And, and, and Jacob, he's kind of like a mama's boy. Okay, he liked to stay around the house. He, as I read it, he's kind of, eh, Jacob's kind of a mama's boy. And he sticks back at home a lot. And Esau had been out hunting, and he came back, and he was famished. He was famished. And Jacob had made this amazing stew. And when Esau came in, he's like, Jacob, give me that stew. And, and, and actually, when you read through the verses, it's like Esau saying, I will just swallow that stew whole. I am that hungry right now. I will just swallow it. I won't even chew it. I'm that hungry. And Jacob says, Give me your birthright. Give me your birthright. And, and, and guess what Esau does? He surrenders it for that bowl of stew. Now, we could spend all night, all day, day after day, night after night, talking about how foolish Esau was. We could think, man, this guy's a dummy. This guy's a fool. Why would he trade away? Why would he make a decision in a moment like that? Why would he do that? But I think what would be more profitable for us today is to examine how you and I can easily make wrong decisions. In a moment, we can make decisions that change the trajectory of our entire life. They can change our entire lives in a way that we would be shocked if we only knew. And guess what? The devil is preparing a stew for you now. He's working on it. He's cooking it. He's waiting for the perfect moment to serve it to us. He's waiting for that moment when you feel unloved. That moment you feel unlikely. That moment you feel like you're the end of yourself. And when we reach that moment, the devil knows it's the perfect moment 
to serve sin into our life. It's the perfect moment to serve us this stew, this, this temptation that can affect the trajectory of our entire life, that can, uh, that can cause us to suffer from the, the same Esau syndrome, this idea of throwing away the promises of God for something today, something fleeting, something that's just going to go away, that's not going to be with us very long, just a momentary pleasure. So what I'd like to do today is I'd like to examine some ideas, some, some takeaway truths that, that we can jot down. So if you'd get your notes out, if you'd prepare to take some notes, and guess what, you don't have to worry. I know you don't need paper. You've got smartphones, and I know there's a note feature in there. Because if these truths are going to be evident in our life, and we're going to apply these truths to our lives, we've got to revisit these truths. So we need to jot them down. We need to jot them down because all of us are susceptible to, in a moment, making a bad decision. Is there anyone here like me that's susceptible to making a bad decision in a moment? In just a fleeting moment, I can make a decision that I regret the rest of the day. You know, Amy called me today and, to, and she said, hey, I got you, you got to make this decision and and a lot of days, i got to make a lot of decisions all day long. There's just a lot of things getting thrown at us all day long. And so Amy calls me, and she says, hey, this couple needs to do this thing, and we already have a book for this thing, and can you allow them to use it? Can you allow them to use the facility? And my answer is just like, no, move on. Nope, move on, and I move on. And then in a minute, in just a second, God interrupted me. It was one of those like divine interruption things. And I was like, put yourself in their shoes. And I had to go back to that family and I had to change my decision because I know God was speaking to me. That I know it's so easy for us to make wrong decisions in a moment. And I made a wrong decision in a moment and God was quick to correct me. He's like, you're too busy in what you're doing today. You're forgetting about people today. We get so busy, we get so bogged down in this world that guess what can happen? Listen, I want you to get this. I want you to get this. Your desire can keep you from your destiny. Your desires can keep you from your destiny. My desire is to serve Jesus Christ. My desire is to serve well. But I can be kept from my destiny. I can be kept from these moments in my life when I'm not ready to be. Because there's God moments that we can have in our lives. So how does this relate to this idea of sexuality and romance and, and relationship? You see, God desires for each of us in the bonds of a relationship, a marriage between a husband and a wife, as Pastor Will said, to have banging sex. Okay, God's desire for our marriage life is to have great sex. But sex can become a driver to us, out, especially outside of the bounds of a marriage. But even inside of the bounds of a marriage, it can become an unhealthy bound, an unhealthy driver. We can develop appetites in a moment that are not wholesome and not, and not honoring of our marriage. And we can swipe wrongly instead of rightly very quickly. We can find it on Facebook. We can find it on Instagram. We can find it on Twitter. You can find it in all sorts of social media. You can find it on Google. You could be searching a, just a, an innocent image and then the wrong image pops up. And we can be titillated to click. We can be titillated to click. We can be titillated to swipe wrongly and swipe, instead of swiping rightly. You see, God has a plan for you. He's got a plan for me. And it's not a temporary plan. It's an eternal plan. God has an eternal plan for you, and we do not need to derail it with temporary things. 
Because we so easily can derail the plans and the purpose that God has for us in a moment. In a simple moment that we can, we can end up having our desire distract us from our destiny. Our momentary desires can cause destruction to our destiny. Because God for sure loves you. He loves you and he has a plan and a purpose for you. And he has a destiny that's unbelievable for each and every one of us. The second thing I want us to jot down is this. When your stomach gets empty, your standards get lower. When your stomach gets empty, your standards get lower. Who's ever noticed that? I've been on my way home. I'm going to make this amazing meal. It's going to be good. And then my wife doesn't show up on time. And then I eat potato chips for dinner. <laughs> I have this amazing plan. It's going to be great. I'm going to be like Chef Boy oh Boy. And then I make ramen noodles. Or who's ever gone to the gone shopping when they're hungry? Oh, what a mistake. What a mistake. How do we act when our stomachs are empty? So how do we act when our spiritual stomachs are empty? How vulnerable are we in those moments when our spiritual stomach is empty? What kind of colossal mistakes can we make when our spiritual stomach is empty? See, I want you to get this. Don't trade what you want most for what you want right now. Don't settle for potato chips when you can have filet mignon. See, God's got a plan. He's got a purpose. He's got an amazing plan and purpose for each of us, a destiny that we all can walk into. And we so much oftentimes settle for so much less. You see, the devil has tremendous timing. He shows up with temptation at the right time in the right moment. You just had a fight with your wife. You just had a bad day at work. You're feeling unworthy or unlikely. You're feeling overlooked. You're feeling unloved. The hot water heater broke and the transmission slipping in your car. And your life's full of problems. The kids won't do this and this is not happening right. And all of a sudden, the devil shows up with a pre-made meal. It's a meal of sin. It's convenient sin, and it's the sin you already know about. It's the sin you already turn into. It's that sin, that's just that little sip. I'm just not going to eat the whole stew. I'm just going to taste the spoon. I'm just going to taste it. And it becomes a, a slippery slope. And we don't just taste the spoon, do we? We slide so easily. You know what's amazing? How Jesus handled temptation. You know, it says in the word of God that he kept himself full of the word. And when the devil tempted him, he didn't, he didn't, he didn't falter at all. See, God's calling you and me to be full of his word each and every day. See, before we leave our homes in the morning, we need to make sure our spiritual stomachs are full. We need to make sure our spiritual stomachs are full. We need to walk into this world with full stomachs and hands prepared to do God's will. We need to know where our values are. And we need to honor those values. And when we're full of God's word, we can't help but succeed. So listen, don't trade what you want most for what you want right now. Don't trade what you want most for what you want right now. Don't settle for potato chips. And the third thing is, if you're writing these down, in all you do, think follow through. In all you do, think follow through. This is the idea that if Esau had just stepped back from that table, if he had just paused for a moment and thought that through, the stew for this birthright, 
You see, God promises in his, us in his word that the, just at the moment before we're going to, there is an alternative. At the moment before we're ready to, to, to walk past the point of no return, right at that moment there is an alternative for us. But we get so busy in our lives. We get so busy in the day-to-day of what we're living and we're racing and we're racing and like me today, making a quick snap decision. Boom, I know the decision I gotta make, I'm moving on. I know the decision I gotta make, I'm moving on. I know that comfortable sin I always go to. But then I'll move on. I only took a sip. I didn't eat it all. Listen, in all that you do, we need to think follow through. We need to think back and forward. We need to think of our decisions in the eyes of eternity. We need to hit pause. We need to slow down. We need to make right decisions, not wrong decisions for our lives. It's so easy to get bogged down in the day-to-day. It's so easy to, to just do and make the mistake over and over and over again. You know, I recently started taking up a sport, archery. Yeah, it wasn't running. Look at me. I ain't running. Okay, I ain't running. Okay, so it's archery because I can stand still. Okay, so that's why, that's why it was archery. Okay, if we could just find a way to get the arrows to come back to me. It would be so much better, so much better. So, but this idea takes place in archery, believe it or not. You have to think about the follow-through. When you pull back and then you get ready to release the arrow, you have to hold the bow tight. Just have to hold it. Because guess what? If you just flinch for a second, what happens? What happens? You miss the mark. In just a moment, we can miss the mark. It only takes a moment for us to miss the mark. See, we need to think about follow through. We need to see, think about it in the, in the context of eternity. When we're getting ready to make a decision, what does this decision look like in my life 10 years from now, 30 years from now? What is this decision going to look like at my deathbed? What is that decision going to look like that day? Is this going to be a right decision for my life? Is this going to be a wrong decision for my life? Am I going to swipe wrongly or am I going to swipe rightly? I think the, 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 think about the, the, the right now, today, we are talking about Esau. His decision thousands of years later We're talking about that. And it was a bowl of soup. It was a bowl of soup. We need to think about our decisions in the context of eternity. Through thousands of generations, God shows up and shows off in our lives. And I can guarantee you right now, at the end of your life, you're not going to wish you you made more money. You're not going to wish you had more stuff. You're not going to wish you had more prestige. It's going to be about relationships. It's going to be about the relationship with your wife and children. It's going to be about your relationship with your family. It's going to be about your relationship with Jesus Christ. See, we have an opportunity to affect our own eternity. So as we get ready to close up here in a moment, I'm going to have the team come back and Start playing a little behind me here with some keys. Our entire lives can change in a moment. Our entire lives can change in a moment. And as we look at Esau's life, as we look at what Esau did, and he went past the point of no return, I don't want to end today making people think, well, hey, I won't pass the point of no return. There's no hope for me. Because I can tell you, In my life, I went past the point of return over and over and over again. And guess what? There might have been consequences. Jesus is not going to erase those consequences. 
But Jesus still wanted to show up and show off in my life. I wasn't past his hand. Jesus is there right now with his arms open wide. Even if you feel like you've gone past the point of return, the point of no return, Jesus is still standing there right now. He's standing there with his arms wide open. He's waiting for you right now. He's waiting for us to surrender our hearts and our lives to him. You don't have to feel overlooked anymore. You don't have to feel unlikely or unloved. You don't have to feel like you went past the point of no return and there's no going back. Because we have Jesus. We have Jesus. So right now I can guarantee you, because I know how this works, there's someone in here tonight, today, who, guess what, has gone past the point of no return. But right now you can surrender your heart and you can surrender your life to Jesus. So I'm going to ask all of us to, to bow our heads right now. And for those of you who have already accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, I'm going to encourage you to, to say this loud and proud. It's almost like you're holding the hand of that man or woman who's sitting in the corner right now who's getting ready to surrender their heart. It's like you're going to cheer them on as they change their eternity, as they surrender their life to Jesus. So with all heads bowed and all eyes closed, I'm going to ask you to repeat after me. Dear God, I want to be a part of your family. You said in your word that if I acknowledged that you raised Jesus from the dead and that I accepted him as my Lord and Savior, I would be saved. So God, I now say, I believe you raised Jesus from the dead. He is alive and he is well and I accept him now as my Lord and my Savior. Amen.